Welcome, cacao lovers. Today we are with Dahlia and Brian from Fruition Chocolate. We are also with a very special guest, Maricel Prasilla, and my co-host today, Nadia Rizek. Hi, everyone. Let's go around the table and uh, and uh, say hello. <laughs> Hi, Dahlia here from Fruition Chocolate. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm a co-founder. That was a really quick introduction. <laughs> Didn't really tell you much about myself. <laughs> Should I say something else? <laughs> um, I'm Brian. I'm the co-founder and uh, head chocolate maker at Fruition. I'm the other half of the co-founding team. <laughs> <laughs> and I am Maricel Presilla, and the co-founder of the International Institute of Chocolate and Cacao Tasting. And I'm Nadia Reisek. Um I'm currently spearheading the Cacao USA project in US. And I'm the host, Daisy. Uh, we're missing the other host today, which is Max, but um, Max is uh, in chocolate making business. As we kick off this week, our chocolate making residency in Cacao USA with our first chocolate making guest, who's Michael Lysconis. So um, we'll give him permission to skip by on this episode. But We'll have him on uh, on the next one. Well, guys, uh, thank you so much for being here and agreeing to get on this podcast. I know it had been a while that we tried to coordinate this, but we're very happy that it finally happened. And the first thing we want to know, um, how did you guys get into chocolate making? I think that's the one that I have to start with because um, Dahlia got into chocolate making through me. Um, I'm one of those lucky kids that kind of knew what they wanted to do from like a really young age. I knew I wanted to work in food. Um, I started working at a, a, a restaurant in Woodstock, New York when I was 16 um, in the kitchen. And then I spent a couple days in the bake shop and I just like fell in love with pastry and baking. Um, I grew up near the Culinary Institute of America, not far away. Um, and. You know, I remember as a little kid when I like when my parents would drive past this this building that looks like a huge castle on the on the Hudson River, and they would say, "That looks like that's a place where you can go to learn how to be a chef." And I was like, "That that that exists." <laughs> um, so I I knew I wanted to go there, but um, it did it didn't really work out logistically or financially like right out of high school. So I started working in restaurants. Um, became the pastry chef kind of by default at, at a place called the Bear Cafe in Woodstock. Um, did that for a few years and then um, I was finally able to attend the CIA and um, that's kind of where I fell in love with uh, with chocolate and I mean and so I furthered my skills in baking and pastry um, and then I took a I took a class the chocolate and confections class with a chef named Peter Grueling and it was it was there that I like knew like chocolate. That's what I want to do. Um, and from there, um, we started tinkering with the idea of um, what kind of chocolate business we would have. And I really loved doing confections um, and and stuff like that. And like what would make our business unique? So we always thought that we would. The goal would be we're going to be a confectionery company, a chocolatier who also happens to make ch our own chocolate. So we've never bought a single a single pre-made piece of chocolate. We've made all of our own chocolate from from cocoa beans. Um, and at the time that was like somewhat unique, I think. Um, Mar Marcel probably knows like the timeline <laughs> yeah, yeah. of like every chocolatier yeah. chocolate maker. Um, <laughs> But um, so but I do so, know yours because I've been following <laughs> yeah. you from day one. But we we started experimenting like first at, like home in my kitchen. It was um, Peter Grueling that I first made I made my first batch of chocolate with because I started pestering him like I like they they cover in a lecture at the CIA like the process of making chocolate like here's a cacao pod here's finished chocolate and here's how to you know here's how it turns into it but you don't actually do it practically so I kept asking and asking like could could we do this so we. We, we threw together uh, like a very rudimentary ball mill and um, made a first batch of chocolate, and it was terrible chocolate. But it was <laughs> it was objectively bad chocolate. That's that's um, before the Coco Towns. It was before Coco Towns. Yeah, um, it was it was using a small panning machine, and we threw some ball bearings in, and that became our our ball mill. Um, but it was and and it was you know it was it was made with cocoa nibs from the from the CIA's storeroom. Um, that tasted like cardboard, you know, <laughs> like nobody knows what the origin was. They were sitting on a shelf probably for 10 years. Um, and it was objectively bad chocolate, but it was it was my 
bad chocolate. And, <laughs> um, and from there, I started like learning about the process. And he sort of he gave me a little bit of guidance on like what books to read, um, like big industrial manufacturing books. But that's where I started to like learn more about the processing. Um, and then I started making chocolate at home in small batches and just like learning here and there. And um, um, that was while I was, after I had graduated from the CIA, I started working there um, as a sous chef to one of the instructors. And I was like the whole time I was, I was making chocolate at home and experimenting and, you know, tinkering with the idea of starting our own business. And it, it sort of um, came to fruition. <laughs> there, there's the pun we were waiting for. <laughs> well, Dahlia, and then how did that, uh, how did Brian get you into the chocolate making world then? Um, I mean, I learned about it through at home, like uh, actually peeling roasted cocoa beans that we had roasted in our toaster oven, peeling them um, and refining in a small melanger just at, just at home for friends and family who was making chocolate um, way back in probably 2000. Nine, two thousand ten, and then we we traveled, and I've I've spent a lot of time in Peru, um, but we also traveled to Costa Rica, and um, and we visited cacao. We visited cacao farms. We went to the Dominican, and so in each experience, we I learned not only. I mean, I, I always had a sweet tooth, so <laughs> <laughs> when he was into chocolate, that was a plus. Um, but I didn't like most consumers um i didn't understand where the chocolate candy bar came from you know i i was just used to okay you get a milky way as a treat when you're a kid and it's exciting and it has chocolate but i didn't i didn't know and then you go and you see um trees and cacao pods and you learn that there's terroir and that there's variety that and there's nuance so much that goes and, into it. yeah mm -hmm. and it, it's fascinating i mean and then just being able to actually suck on the seeds of this fruit and be like wow this is really the beginning um do you remember the the date um of your first um packaging design um we well we launched our business in 2011 so as far as our like officially under the brand fruition around then, but before then we used to stamp <laughs> like little envelopes and wait. So I think probably even the year before, maybe 2010, we because were tinkering. Because when I, when I met yeah. you at the Meadows, mm -hmm. which no longer exists, sadly, uh, sadly, sadly yeah. um, and you show me, you know, the, your, your packaging and I was so impressed. Uh, and I was impressed by what I tasted. And I just, you know, I said, let me really pay attention to the scopal because they're gonna go places. Um, so do you remember the date, more or less, of, being so of that encounter? Uh, the the Meadow was one of our first customers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's the place that we re like in New York City. That's the place that we really wanted to carry our chocolate. So we reached out to them very early on. It might have been 2012 or something. Yeah, yeah. I, either either very late 2011 or like early 2012. I don't remember the date exactly. Do you remember what was it? Chocolate. <laughs> we um, we had some Costa Rica we, at the time. Yeah, we had we started with we started with Costa Rica, right? Um, like a. Was it? Oh, it was just so long ago. I, I, I want to it remember, it was, I, I, but I was so impressed by by the we two of you, and of course, it. you know, he he was very enthusiastic about your work, and um, and he was special. He would not buy chocolate from just about anyone, yeah. just like that. Uh, so I paid attention, and I really liked I liked you both, and I liked the packaging and and what I tasted. Uh, and for me, that was important. And actually, um, just the other day, I was passing by and I saw the place close, and it really gave me, you know, great uh, sadness to see that because that was an opening place for so many people here in New York. It was expensive, uh, but it was so tastefully done, and your your bars look great there. Thank you. Yeah, the meadow had a beautiful show. Yeah, beautiful this chocolate library, mm -hmm. like. <laughs> So Brian, you mentioned earlier that you started as chocolatiers that made their own chocolates, but do you still consi consider yourself like chocolatiers or cho more as chocolate makers? Yeah, the, the idea was 
we were going to start as, as a chocolatier that just just happens to make our own chocolate. Yeah. Um, and and we'd make a few bars. Um, and then early on, thanks to people like Maricel, um, we we got a lot of we got a fair amount of recognition for from our our chocolate bars. Um, and now we're we're making a lot more in the way of bars as com as as opposed to confections. Um, but like uh, the the goal now is like we kind of want to like push into like doing more and more confections. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we're we're definitely a, a chocolate maker more than a than a confectionery company right now. But um, that's still like where my where my heart and is. And you do so. understand flavor, and you do understand sometimes that um, certain cacaos do better, for example, in a milk. Uh, Mm -hmm. recipe like marañón for example i think that your milk marañón is extraordinary and and that's that's one of the reasons that we we discontinued the dark marañón mm. because the the milk the milk version was was selling much better um and in, in fact um i don't know exactly what the numbers are but we sell a lot more milk chocolate mm -hmm. than we do dark oh, it, really? was a, it was wow. a benchmark mm -hmm. for for milk uh chocolate in the united states because it really show people that when treated seriously, uh, it can be extraordinary. Uh, some people like to put down milk chocolate, and that change with your Marañón milk. <laughs> and how did you guys decide on starting with single origin? Because a lot of chocolate makers just start experimenting with um, either inclusions or percentages, but not un it's not until they learn more about the cacao industry that they start going into single origin and talking about the um, origin country specifically. But how was that for you guys? Was it like out of curiosity? I think there was some inspiration from early chocolate makers like Rogue and Patrick and um, Amano. And, you know, we were following, he was, he was eating and enjoying chocolate, and there was also kind of a newer movement wave of chocolate makers focusing on single origin. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, w with a background in, in pastry and confectionery, um, I, I also saw when, when the trend sorted, sort of was um, single origin, two ingredient dark bars. Um, as as a cook, as a baker, like I almost found that limiting. So um, we started doing milk chocolates. You know, we started we started making some um, some lower percentage bars with added cocoa butter and vanilla. Blasphemy at the time, but um, <laughs> but not, you know, um, we started doing some inclusion bars and flavored bars. And you know, by no means were we the first or even early on doing that, but. Um, I, I, fe I feel that it would be so limiting for us to just say, we're going to do strictly two ingredient dark chocolate. Um, and also, um, as, as a confectionery company, we, um, some, some chocolates, like some, some confections work much better with a milk chocolate, or um, it's, it's easier to shell mold something beautiful uh, with uh, chocolate that has a little bit of added cocoa butter. So, mm -hmm. um, so we do that. Um, it's, 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 strange to me that um that it's not more accepted i mean it is now for sure but yeah and uh we have a common link that mar it was marcel's fault i guess that brought us together <laughs> <laughs> well thanks to you i guess but um it's called los bejucos <laughs> Maricel. Los Pejucos. Tell is us a little my, bit. Well, yeah. it's, it has a denomination <laughs> of origin since 2012. And it it's located in, in Duarte province, which is really the heartland of organic uh, cacao production in the Dominican Republic <clears throat> since the 19th century. And, and it's an old um, cacao growing area um, with a lot of tradition, uh, 200 um, organic farmers. Uh, in that area, in farms that range in size, but they're pretty small, but they still yeah, keep small. some of the, you know, the old drying barcasas, you know, which are these, you know, dryers on, on, on wheels. Uh, and it, it's, it's really a beautiful uh, forested area. And I love to see these farms almost as a natural uh, uh, reserve. reserves because uh, the, the organic agriculture is taken very seriously there. So it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a whole universe of, of wellness 
it's so close to San Francisco de Macorís, but the fact that, you know, everything is organic and that animals are protected, it just makes it so special. And I love the genetic cocktail of this, uh, of these farms. And I like the roundness uh, of the beans. I love the idea that it has a very strong uh, cacao component. Uh, so when I make a brownie with it, uh, you know, it comes through beautifully. But at the same time, it has a lot of nuances. It has uh, dry fruit. It has, you know, red berries uh, and also uh, walnuts and a pinch of olives. Uh, and it's something that I love in, in some cacaos uh, from the Dominican Republic that, you know, the, the, the green or, or black olive uh, notes, which are very special. So if you treat this cacao well, uh, gently, it, you don't have to be minimalist here. You can really afford to roast a little bit higher, a uh, higher temperature than and all the cacaos. You get all this incredible complexity. Uh, and I do love the fruit. I think that, you know, it's fruit forward uh, and it keeps, it stays strong throughout the processing. Mm -hmm. It's very much alive. So that's why I love it. And um, knowing your your chocolates and understanding the cacao that you use, I felt that, you know, something like that would be good for your repertoire. And I think it's good to mention that the fact that it's a denomination of origin, it assures mm -hmm. consistency in the beans. So consistency consistency in quality consistency in flavor so it's and i think consistency is very important nowadays so well, but at the same time the the fact that um Rizek gets the cacao from these small farmers you know you're talking about you know uh closer to 100 now mm -hmm. um and taking that cacao to a central location and understanding how to treat it you know the the fermentation protocol there uh, is very different, you know, that w than with other origins. So you get something very specific to to get those pronounced, uh, you know, notes of dry fruit, for example, and that cacao uh, core. So I felt, you know, by just examining the the different cacaos that you use, that you that maybe that would be very good for your selection because I think it filled a niche. <laughs> Uh, so I, you know, I, I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, we, um, we uh -huh. released a limited 77% Bahuco. So I think, um, and it's sold incredibly well. We're down to the last less than 200 bars. So if you want one, check out our website <laughs> now before Bye they're now. all gone. FruitionChocolateWorks.com. Um, so, uh, but what's interesting about having a business that we've been doing for about 10 years oh, where we came up on our our 10th anniversary of the business this year um is that the core chocolate bars that we make regularly we're constantly tweaking improving making better and better and better and then we try something new where we're just like okay here it is and you just kind of throw it to the wind and see how it's received and see how people like it and then you decide okay maybe we'll change the percentage or change the formulation or we're going to try a different rose so this um uh when we put out the bahucos is really kind of the the first um taste of what we're able to do with it and yeah. you know down the road as we explore maybe there'll be another iteration to look out for yeah and, and <laughs> when, when dahlia says the first i mean that that's that's the first that anybody else outside of our shop gets to taste um i have a like a core team of people so um, myself, my head chocolate maker, um, and and our our core team of people will will taste it, will tweak it, will re roast it, will make another batch, and it goes through it goes through several several iterations before we scale it up to a production size batch. Um, okay, yeah, I didn't mean no testing at all. I just mean that you know, <laughs> just, I know. how he, how he corrected you. No, I did. I did uh, in that very specific no point. I, I just, I just don't want people to think that we um, that just, just, just throw, throw, some, throw some beans roaster. in the roaster and <laughs> take it out and grind it now up. Let no, let me ask you in terms well, of Dahlia's the roasting. Well, Dahlia's was the romantic representation of what happens <laughs> yeah. rather than the technical. In terms of the roasting, you know, how um, how do you feel this this these beans like to be roasted? Because <laughs> you need to ask dun, that. Dun, dun. How do you like me to roast you? 
<laughs> well, we ask all of our the, and the bees will say very gently, or, yeah. or you know, you can apply a little bit more well, heat. I'm, I'm curious to know what you guys thought when uh, Marcel was kind of pushing with this profile, because I remember that when you visited the Dominican Republic and you visited this origin, I mean, you really got a, a really in-depth look at um, not only the the beans and the post harvest and everything, but also the cultural and social environment that goes on. Uh, in this, yes, I spent, in this area. I spent time with, with the farmers and actually understanding uh, the plants that grew in these farms and the animals that were allowed to live uh, protected there. And I was quite taken. But uh, I think in Setico, mm -hmm. at the fermentation center, we did a lot of tastings uh, with this origin in different, uh, you know, different fashions. So we tasted everything, you know, the bean um, uh, raw, roasted in diff different temperatures. We tasted uh, the liquor, uh, we, uh, different kinds of fermentation protocols. Um, so I got to understand it pretty well. And I felt that, um, that it would be a stellar Uh, origin for your company mm -hmm. and also for the Dominican Republic. And actually, there is a farm called Tireo that is kind of a, you know, your flagship uh, farm now in, in Los Bejucos, and it's very close to Los Ancones. And you're probably familiar with Los Ancones because uh, Cruisel has been buying um, that cacao for a long time. It was their, their second premier crew. Um, after La Concepcion, yeah. which I used to, you know, uh, work on. And I, I always, I've always loved Los, Los Ancones, but I mm -hmm. think Tireo is even better. Oh, wow. And Tireo, it's, it's representative of what Los Bejucos uh, can do, except that it has much more diversity because you have, you know, 200 farmers as opposed to one single farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and different uh, genetics a little bit. Well, with that in mind, how was it for you guys when she came to you with this amazing profile? Well, actually, I mean, I, I saw Marcel at an event. This was a, quite a while ago, probably about three years ago. And I whispered to her, what's, what's the next new origin that we need to know about? You know, check out Los Pejucos. You know? um, so, so it's been kind of, and then it took us a while. You coaxed us and, you know, sent the samples and we play, you know, we played with it and then we did the testing and then we released the bar. So it's been kind of an evolution and, um, and now uh, Cacao has this fabulous concept shop in uh, Williamsburg um, that we just visited earlier today and mm -hmm. featuring all of the different origins mm -hmm. and the different beans. So this is kind of like our introduction to all of that you have to offer and, and more to explore. And it's interesting because my affection for Los Bejucos, besides the cultural mm -hmm. and natural elements of this region, is because I'm a cook. And um, I look for the symphony. And when I make, when I cook with chocolate, I look for that. But it doesn't mean that I don't appreciate other origins. For example, my current fascination is with Nacional. Uh, it's this Ecuadorian cacao that is growing in the Dominican Republic. And it's, it's something that happened through decades. That cacao was introduced by planters in the Dominican Republic and it was all over the uh, the island, and then uh, it was collected and taken to a germplasm bank and where RISEC found it and decided to create a farm with only Nacional. And Nacional is extraordinary. If you taste it in Ecuador, if you find a place that has pure Nacional, is something beyond. Actually, you do have a, an iteration of Nacional with Marañón mm -hmm. uh, from Peru. Uh, which has a different flavor profile than the uh, pure Nacional from, from Ecuador. But this is even different uh, because obviously, you know, it's a different terroir. It's but, interesting to but, see but, the Nacional in different countries. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a chameleon too. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a very gentle flavor and it's a very refined flavor that needs the gentle hand. Uh, the chocolate maker has to be careful. 
you cannot over roast, you cannot over process because you lose the, the beautiful nuances of flavor. And this particular Nacional from the Dominican Republic has a lot of banana flavor, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's very prominent. It, it's very prominent. I mean, Maris, oh, I, I tasted a piece and, and Maricel, you're, Maricel said you're going to taste ripe bananas, and that was the first thing I tasted. So um, I'm really inspired by that cacao, and I really want to get my hands on some and, and make some chocolate out of That's it. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. when I, I wonder who we can ask about getting some. <laughs> <laughs> Um, lucky to have good friends with us at yes. the table. But, <laughs> yeah, no, I tasted a little bit of the um, freshly roasted and winnowed uh, cocoa nibs from the Nacional that Michael Escanas was working on earlier mm -hmm. today. And before I had the seed planted about the banana profile for me, I was like, ooh, it's a little bit nutty and maybe like a little brightness, some cherry, citrus kind of peeking through. And so... What's um what's fun and and exciting about tasting cacao with different people is just like picking up on the different notes and then sometimes you don't notice something until somebody says it and then mm -hmm. you you look and aerate and look for it and you know and everyone's experience mm -hmm. has been different mm -hmm. because of what people have eaten their whole lives like we've I taste the ripe bananas right away because I've been eating ripe bananas in Dominican Republic my whole life so it's part of her you know sensory <laughs> memory so it affects and I everyone. wonder you know if if, you, if we do like a you know comparison uh, a, a test with your marañón, mm -hmm. because again it's the genetics is you know they are national. That would be really cool. Both that would be fun. Yeah. National, so it would be fun to really see this, and maybe ha you know get a sample from from Ecuador, and, and notice. But I do know that this is very unique, so I, I, I enjoy it tremendously. Uh, there is another farm, La Magdalena, that has also what they call light break. So they have found cacaos with white cotyledons, not necessarily Ecuadorian mm -hmm. um, in origin, uh, but the, the taste is different. It's more caramel, mm -hmm. more dulce de leche. Mm -hmm. And the also, color, is the, it looks like milk chocolate. It, it's mm -hmm. beautiful. You, when we go back to the store, you should see it. You know, the color is extraordinary. But in terms of the flavor complexity, I think that I prefer Nacional. But there are other regions that uh, are fascinating, which is El Valle. Uh, there were Swiss, a Swiss company was there uh, early on, um, you know, in the colonial period and later um, in that area, which is, you know, it has, it has a fascinating history, but also it's Monte Plata. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, with very small farm, it's a very poor area that is uh, going through a a process of revival through cacao, uh, which I find fascinating. So these areas are still in flux. You know, I think that, you know, you guys need to still figure out what's the perfect fermentation and drying protocol for those cacaos. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing to me that the Dominican Republic, being such a small country, has so many different niches for cacao. Mm -hmm. And each is unique. And I think that's something we always try to say, like one country does not mean one flavor. It's something we always try to communicate to people. Well, I'm curious for um, fruition uh, chocolates. What uh, do you guys have any exciting upcoming projects, projects that you're working on or new bars that you want to discuss? Well, our latest is that kind of playing on this concept of using the chocolate that we've made in confectionery work is um, kind of a re-thought out, re-release of some of our pan-coated um, uh, chocolate covered nuts. So we do uh, smoked almonds that are coated in dark chocolate with smoked sea salt. Um, and then we have a pecans that are coated in a cinnamon maple milk chocolate. And then we just, the newest addition to that lot is um, hazelnuts that are uh, citrus in, with citrus infused milk chocolate. And there's citrus kind of throughout the layers that Brian has crafted in, mm. um, <laughs> like woven in with, there's Meyer lemon and orange. It's really wonderful. So, um, so that those are, they come in tins and uh, make a wonderful gift or sharing. So these item. can all be bought online? All online, yeah. Fruition, F-R-U-I-T-I-O-N, chocolate. <laughs> Hope you know how to spell it, <laughs> dot com. Well, I'm curious, which has been your most challenging bar to create? That's a tough question. <laughs> um, 
I, I, I don't I don't know if there's a specific answer. Yeah, yeah Mar Maricel is mouthing the words. <laughs> no, I think uh, actually I think it probably wild Bolivia. The wild Bolivia. That's challenging, mm -hmm. right? That's that's well, a more it's, that's that's a challenging in. cacao to work with mm -hmm. um, because the the seeds are so small, uh, so they they roast completely differently than any of the other cacaos that we that we use. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of winnowing that has to happen to those. Um, uh, so like that part is challenging, but I think once we dialed in the roast and, and the the processing of it, that one's that that one's fairly like on on track. Um, but yes, uh, Maricel, you're right. The the Marignon, um, I mean, they're I I love those beans. I know there are some chocolate makers that have a hard time working with them. Um, so much so that we've gotten offers from some of our friends, other chocolate makers. They're like, so you guys make a, re a really good Marignon bar. Um, I've got all this marignon that I just can't I do think anything you're with. Really, your so marignon you bar buy? to me is the best. It was the best marignon here in the U.S. Thank yeah. you. Well, Thank yeah, you. Well, you you prove that you know great chocolate could be made. Yeah. With, with so marignon. my my head chocolate maker Chris, um, who really um, right now single handedly makes almost all of our chocolate. Um, and he he has a really good palate. He he works really uh, really well um, figuring out the roasting profiles with me uh, and the processing times, temperatures, and all of that. Um, and he really does not like our our Marignon bar. Um, he well, let me correct myself. He really did not like our dark uh, seventy six percent Marignon bar. Um, and I, I don't know what it was about it. So I mean, seventy six percent. That, yeah, that was, that, was the that was the problem. Mm -hmm. Which, which is why it no longer exists. Um, but the, but the sixty-eight percent dark milk bar, um, I, th I think it, it, I think that's the right percentage. I think it's the right amount of milk. But it took a while to get to that point. And it was, and it was really unique to have a milk chocolate that was such a high percentage at the time. It was really like the it highest was that we knew. It was of. revolutionary, yeah. but it was exactly what the Marañón cacao needed to tame it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's how that's how we always describe it. But you it. mentioned that you know working with the wild uh, Bolivian cacao being very small and difficult to process, so it prepares you for chuncho. That's right. Because I know you're working on that. Too. That's yeah. That's that's one of the next projects. Actually, probably later this week, I'll start doing more test roasting of the chuncho. So you're gonna go into uh, into Peruvian also, besides the Dominican Republic. <laughs> uh, but Dalia, you have uh, a story with Peru that is very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Can you can you tell us about Corazón de Dalia, your sure, charity I'll in try Cusco? To, I'll try to squeeze it into a, a little <laughs> tidbit, but I. Um, I went and lived with a Peruvian host family in Cusco for about six months um, between high school and college. And while I was there, I volunteered teaching English at a local elementary school. Um, and I fell in love with the culture and the, the kids and this kind of the spirit of the Andes. And I was learning all about the Inca culture and my host family spoke both Quechua and Spanish in the home. and. Um, and I just really formed a connection and I couldn't, I, they, their, their family, the family that I was living with became like a second family for me. And at the end of, um, at the end of my time there, I actually brought one of my host sisters back to the U.S. with me. We got a special uh, visa for her and she came and got to experience my home and meet, meet uh, um, my grandparents, meet my parents and um, kind of we've we're still to this day really close and um and so that's kind of how it started and then later i went back and i wanted to do another kind of toward the end of the elementary school experience i raised money to paint the school and um the on, on kind of the first of the the six months was split into two three month stays and at the end of the first three months I um, helped with teachers and family members from the community we painted the entire building and we had local artists put a mural on on the school that was a collection I had my students put on a post-it note what they wanted to see on their building when they walked into school because it was really pretty dilapidated the paint was chipping it was you know uh, kind of a dark brown and mu muted yellow color so I went with like bright 
uh, navy blue and like kind of sea turquoise color for the building. And then we had this mural in reds and yellows that kind of inter, it was a interweaving of designs that the children had drawn. And then I gave it to artists at a local school and they put it all together. And then there was a big ceremony to kind of like unveil this, uh, this mural. And so I went back to the US inspired and I was a ski instructor at uh, Hunter Mountain, and I said to my my parents, I said, can I go back to Peru? And they said, well, you're working, and if you uh, earn enough money, you can go back for the, the next semester. So I so that's what I did, and I went back, and while, while I was home, I, I hosted a fundraiser and raised money to build a library at the school. And so every day I went out and I selected books for the library and then I'd come home and my host sisters would help me number them and, you know, do the book covers. And then we had, you know, family from the school. Anyway, so this could go on and on. But but so that was kind of, that was the beginning. And then I did another project that was um, at a, it was at a boy's home for street kids who had been, um, who really needed a support structure, and, and we did a project there, and then um, and then after that project, uh, uh, my host mother Laura and I co-founded a nonprofit called Corazon de Dalia, which was her idea. I'm embarrassed that it's named <laughs> after me. Yeah, but um, the name's beautiful. It should be Corazon de Laura. <laughs> so she and her team really ran uh, ran the work on the ground, but I. You know, I thought, okay, if we want to raise money, we have to make this official. So I went to Barnes and Noble. I bought the, the book, you know, how to start a 501c3 nonprofit, and I read through, and I built a board, and I just kind of did it out of a place of um, desire to help. And I was really naive. I didn't understand how much work it would be, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but we got it done, and we and we supported um, a program um, outside of Cusco in a little community called Saya. Um, for many years and uh, probably, a le- well, the past, like, like, how long was it? 10 years or so, 11? Yeah, we need um, more of those initiatives uh, yeah. in, in Latin America. And, and I'm thinking also, you know, in countries, you know, that grow cacao. I think it's a great thing that you got into this at the, uh, you know, in the way that you did. and. I agree with Maricel, absolutely. This is this is what we have to work on in these cacao producing countries. It's very nice to see craft chocolate sell for these really high prices, but we really have to think about the cacao farmers and how does that trickle down. So that's one of the things that really, um, well, Nadia was mentioning when she, when she was speaking about Los Pejucos, is that these denominations of origin are not only um, providing higher quality of cacao beans, but they're also providing higher incomes for these farmers. So when they produce higher quality beans, you know, they get to obtain higher premiums for these beans and they learn about how to properly take care of their farms. So it's one of the ways that for us, for cacao and for the Rizek company, of course, is kind of the way that we've been doing that. So it's good to hear that other chocolate makers are are doing their part as well. So I'm thinking about you know children, obviously, um, because you want them to have an education. But at the same time, I'm also thinking about the future of these farms. You don't, you don't want to see an aging you know cacao farming population with no you know second generation to come in. Uh, but at the same time, you have to make it uh, exciting and you have to make it uh, fruitful, uh, you have to get some fruition here mm-hmm. by educating mm-hmm. uh, this next generation of farmers so they, that they would have advantages maybe that their parents didn't have. Mm-hmm. But it's through programs, uh, it's by applying, you know, what you did. But yes, it was Corazon de Dalia because it was heartfelt uh, and you put your heart into it. So we need more more Corazones de Dalia, mm. uh, yeah. you know, all over, all over Latin America. Absolutely. But with, you know, looking at cacao growing communities. I'm thinking about Monte Plata, for example. Yeah. But you, you already do a lot of work with Fuparoca. Yeah. You know, which is, you know, the uh, nonprofit. Or uh, nonprofit. It, exactly. And, and you do a lot of teaching. Uh, yeah. Because and, and it's what Daisy was saying. Like when you teach farmers and when you educate and when you offer all this education, they consequently get higher yields, which consequently get higher premiums for the farmers 
So I we we truly believe in education in all aspects of the business. We educate people with our store. We educate farmers as well. But we try. It's it's a it's a main goal for us at Isek to educate all parts of the industry because I think that with education, the if the if the whole industry focuses on education, then we all prosper as an industry. So. Yeah, and you know we can't forget that at the end of the day, this is a business, not just for us, but for a cacao farmer. So that's their income. And if there's a way that we can contribute to that, then we will absolutely do so. And if it's with education, in our case, that's how we do it. You know, the fo the foundation has been, um, elem uh, has been, uh, how can I say? It's it's been so important driving all of these key factors that play so into be, you quality and production. You wouldn't be able to have organic agriculture without education because it, it, we, we say it's so, you know, openly now, uh, organic farming, mm -hmm. and but it's not simple. I mean, it takes uh, perseverance, it takes education, knowledge to and apply money. that. And money. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, belonging I mean, to certifications costs money. Um, implementing all of these different aspects that certifications required takes money. So that's a great thing that the Fuparoka Foundation does. You know, they handle all of these costs for farmers that aren't able to. And then, you know, we get their certifications going and so you producing have, you organic. So you have to educate people about not cutting trees unnecessarily. Well, they can't in, in mm -hmm. many cases. Or not to kill animals. For example, walking um, through the farms in Los Bejucos and in other uh, areas, I was so uh, intrigued by how farmers, uh, you know, how they, how careful they were. In an, in another situation, in another country, if you see a snake with a farmer, the farmer would get the machete and cut the snake's head. So, but I didn't see that in the Dominican <laughs> Republic. They were saying, no. Uh, we're not going to kill the snake. The snake is what kills the rats. The rats are the problem. Um, woodpeckers, for example. In the Dominican Republic, I, I learned that um, children were paid at a certain moment. They were paid to kill wood, woodpeckers. And they would have to bring like the tongues of the birds oh my. To, the, you know, to the municipalities to be paid because the woodpeckers would obviously um, be a problem in cacao farms. But now nobody kills woodpeckers and they have like, uh, they, they hang um, paper plates, like garlands, you know, uh, from tree to tree so that, you know, so the woodpeckers would not bother cacao. But that's, you know, it, it you cannot take it for granted because there was a problem. Animals would be killed, birds would be killed, snakes would be killed, and not anymore. Yeah, I, I think it's refreshing for us to see every time I visit a plantation personally, there's uh, all of these things are being taken into consideration. So everybody's aware that the children is aware that, you know, you have yeah. to protect the environment. So that's, you know, very important. Yeah, I mean, I mean when start when there. you asked us, for example, mm -hmm. to uh, we went to Monte Plata, one of the origins, to uh, record this uh, remarkable woman and how she does cacao farming in in her um, in her uh, estate in her plantation. Um, she was just surrounded with all of the community kids, and for us, um, it was really like, yeah, sure, you know, come on, let's go to the cacao farms and let's see your grandmother working and. And you know it was like so cool, and she was like, "No, no, no, the kids need to uh, kids need to stay here. They can't come into the farms because certifications say that they could get hurt. So they need to stay right here. You know, we're gonna be working. I have a machete with me. You know, they can't come near me. They have to stay safe. So it was, you know, it's kind of we kind of laughed about it, but the behind, you know, the story is true. They, you know, the kids have to be taken care of, and they're taking this into account. So. It's an interesting line. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, we were like, yeah, sure, come with us. You know, it's going to be so cute. And then she's like, no, they need to stay here. <laughs> mm -hmm. You were doing a special bar for your charity. Oh, Did yeah. So it was um, it was really good. It was Pisco infused cocoa nibs with um, quinoa, 
lime. You want to uh, elaborate on it? Quinoa, lime, maracuya, and pisco. Wow. Wow. It was so good. I mean, it was, it was I sort kind of, of yes, think we amazing. need to bring we, it back. <laughs> in, internally, we called it the Peruvian kitchen sink bar because it was all like really, really wonderful. So Peruvian that was flavors. all at your shop and also online. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it was a limited and, edition. And it was limited limited and, and all of the proceeds. Long gone. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. It, it, was, so it, was, unfortunately. It, was, it was it was hard to make. Um, um, but, uh, every, every dollar that we, that we, um, made selling mm -hmm. that bar went directly to Corazon de Dalia. And we did another Peruvian kitchen sink bar with, uh, Eric Ramirez from Llama Inn. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, oh. That was, yeah. Um, <laughs> with the Peruvian, the, it was the purple potato chips on it. It was chip. so good. Mm. The, those combinations of an ají amarillo. So if we get really wow. hungry today and we just have to have a fruition bar we can go to whole foods and get it right um yeah if you're in the northeast whole foods um, so what can we get in whole foods right now um <laughs> our brown butter milk our hudson bourbon dark milk spring salted dark a lot of dark milks and then our um our yeah uh, some of our darks as well our hispaniola 68 percent our columbia tamaco 85 percent well guys i'm really happy that maricel uh She's actually here by coincidence. Yeah, by coincidence. This was but, an ambush, but I'm yeah. so glad that I stayed. <laughs> Let's call it a coincidence. But um, I'm really happy that you joined us on this podcast today. And I want to thank you guys as well, um, Brian and Dahlia, for um, coming on the podcast. And I know we have so many things to talk about, but we will, we definitely have to do a part two of this episode. Um we're just so happy that you guys are using our beans with the Los Pejucos Bar and hopefully, you know, we'll continue to work together. And, um, you know, Brian, there's a chocolate factory at your disposition <laughs> in Williamsburg whenever my, you want. My, that would be my, the next, yeah. the next uh, mm -hmm. podcast. Yeah my, yeah, my arm could be twisted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we really, like Nadia was saying, we, we really want to showcase the potential of Dominican beans. And thanks, Maricel, for the amazing things you say about us and um you know it's good that you say it not that we say it about ourselves well, it's but it's totally sincere. You, you know yeah. me i yeah. would not be able to to utter a word if i did not believe it yeah well thank you well, we love you mm -hmm. so much for it um so hopefully we'll get to do something together uh, absolutely soon. absolutely <laughs> thank you I for look taking forward. the time to come today it was it was our pleasure um, yeah. it's it's nice to finally be out of the house for, for, <laughs> yeah, for all of us for all all this better. is the first I time know. that we see each other in person yeah. since yeah. last uh, march when yeah. we were all in san francisco one year and two months one ago year unbelievable months. but true yeah mm -hmm. well guys thank, thank you. you so much for listening we'll get back to our chocolate making thank you <laughs>